So a couple of years ago, probably when my daughter was about five, Kate had a little friend, Ellie, over for a play date. And while Kate was talking, I noticed that Ellie was giving her this hand signal. And I said, Ellie, what does this mean? And she said, oh, in school, they teach us to do this to show that we have a connection with someone who's speaking. So I'm up here today to talk to you about the importance of experience. And I figured I'd start by sharing some experiences that I've had as a consumer. And if you can relate to what I'm saying, if you've had a similar experience, I want to, you to give me the connection signal. All right, so this is a little audience participation. Warm up your fingers. So here's the first one. If I'm on an airplane and I paid for Wi-Fi and it's either painfully slow or worse yet, doesn't work at all, I look at my fellow passengers and say, how is this possible in this day and age, right? Like, everyone's done this. How can it not work? It just seems so basic at this point. I just, I expect things to just work. How about this one? I pull up my rideshare app and it says it's 10 minutes for the car to get to me. So I pull up my other rideshare app to see if someone can get to me in five minutes or less. Right? Everybody does this, right? I'm impatient. I expect things to be fast. Then there's this one where I go to try to do something on my phone, and it requires me to enter one of my 200 passwords that I can't remember. And I get frustrated because why can't I just use my thumbprint like I do with my banking app? I expect things to be easy, just one step, ideally. And this last one really always strikes a chord with me. If I check into a hotel property that I have stayed in multiple times, I mean, like, some of these have been dozens of times, and they at some point in the check-in process don't say, welcome back, Ms. Butler, I feel underappreciated because I know that they know, they should know, that I'm a frequent guest, and I expect them to acknowledge our shared history. I expect a more relevant experience. And the reality is that I package all of these ex expectations into one big macro expectation that I take with me to every commercial interaction I have, whether that's on a desktop site, in a store, or especially on my mobile device, on a tent on top of a car. I'm not sure why. Um, but <laughs> the point is that I know that my mobile device knows a lot more context that should enable things to be faster and easier and more relevant. And it's incredibly important for everyone in this room to understand that expectation. Because you're not just competing against the best experience in that category. You're competing against the best experience that consumer has ever had. And whether you're a developer or a designer or a marketing manager or a member of the C-suite, it really impacts everybody in the business. And it's each of your jobs to care about customer experience. And it's our job at Google to work with you as our partners to help you emb to embrace these technologies as much as your consumers have so that you could take advantage of them. And that's why we're here today, to share how delivering a better customer experience is better for your business performance. Truly, your success is our success. If, we're able, if you're able to increase your conversions, that means your ad spend is going to be more effective. And if, you're at, and if your ROAS goes up, you're going to keep investing with us. And that's good for both of us, right? And so the idea is that we want a long-term partnership here. And it's going to continue to evolve as the mobile landscape evolves. So in the spirit of uh, continued audience participation, I'm going to do a little straw poll. Show of hands, how many people in this room would like to double their ad spend? Not everybody? <laughs> and not, sorry, not, I'm sorry, I really said that wrong. Double your return on ad spend. Whoa, that was a major gaffe. Major gaffe. Sorry about that. We're all human. Return on ad spend. Return on ad spend. That's not what I meant. Freudian slip. Sorry about that. And th the thing is that we all work so hard to get like a 2%, a 3%, maybe a 5% increase in our ROAS or in your campaign performance. So something like double digit improvements would be a massive win. And we believe there is an opportunity to double your ROAS. And here's how. We need to double your conversion rate. And to double your conversion rate, we need to focus on your mobile experience. 
if you help your customers have a better experience on mobile, you can massively improve your overall business performance. And the reality is over the last 12 years since the mobile revolution started, we've seen an explosion of smartphones and tablets and different types of devices. And a lot has changed. But the thing is, it can get distracting with all these other devices, right? Just all these other trends. And it's easy to try to kind of chase the shiny new object. And as an industry, it seems like we've got a bit distracted. It seems that we've forgotten some of the mobile fundamentals. Because 12 years into the mobile revolution, where over 50%, 57% of traffic every year is coming in on mobile, mobile conversion rates still drastically lag that of desktop conversion rates. And that's entirely because of one thing. It's because we aren't delivering the best experience that we can on mobile. So there's massive room for improvement on this front. And the thing about mobile is that it can help you go faster, it can, or it can slow your business. It can slow your business, or it can grow your business. And the thing that you have to understand about mobile consumers is that they are less brand loyal than kind of consumers outside of mobile. And that's because they're task-oriented. They are task loyal. They are trying to solve a problem in that moment. And if you can help them, you can win them over. And if you're not helping them fast enough or well enough, they will go elsewhere. So UX is really where you can win and lose customers. And there's a couple big trends that I'd like you to be aware of as you're thinking about the customer experience. The first is around the fact that people are using both mobile web and apps. In my line of work, I get asked all the time, Jane, should I focus on mobile web or I should, fo should I focus on apps? And this is not an either or question. It is really about and. There is a lot of research that's showing that these customers are going back and forth between both of these. And I think probably for many folks in the room, if you've been a desktop conversion-oriented uh, business for a long time, I'm thinking kind of of the online retailers and the online travel aggregators, you probably started off saying, okay, I'm going to move to an M website and then maybe migrated into, all right, we've got uh, our best customers who can use the app. And apps do tend to have high conversion rates and higher basket sizes. So it's smart to look at that, that way. But we've also seen some other examples of more recent companies who were kind of born more in the mobile age who have started off as app only and have started recognizing that there's additional opportunity. So they've built out not only mobile websites, but also desktop sites. So one example I think of is a client I work with called Wish. So if you're not familiar with them, they are the number one globally downloaded retail app in the world. And just in the past year plus, they started moving from just an app world to having both MWeb and desktop sites because they recognize there's way more opportunity they can serve in just one. And there are, the lines are blurring between these two experiences. So half of people um, in shopping sessions, in mobile shopping sessions, go back and forth between a mobile site and an app. And two and three recognize that they can achieve some of the functions, you know, the functions they can do in the app on the website. So it's not, it's truly not an either or situation. It's about and. And the degree to which you engage in each of these is really dependent on what the business use case is for your business, right? So what the use case is for your consumer. So you have to identify, there's a spectrum for sure. But if you're thinking about mobile strategy, don't bifurcate. Think overall, what are the mobile assets that I have and what can I put them to use in different circumstances? It's not going to be the same. Um, they won't be equal necessarily, but you, just, you should think about both of them versus just one or the other. The second big trend is around machine learning. So machine learning has done amazing things to identify patterns in data to then be able to apply that to improving features for, for the consumer experience. And later today, we'll hear from Paul Lambert from our Gmail team about some of the ways that Google has used machine learning to identify new features to enable better consumer experiences. And some of the, if your folks here use Gmail, 
Are you familiar with some of these? You might be familiar with some of these. So there's the um, there's Smart Compose, which kind of starts completing your sentences before you've even gotten there. Um, there's the Smart Reply, which has like a quick button, yep, can do, we'll see you then type of answer. And then there's also Nudging, which is one of my favorites, because if you've gotten an email and you haven't responded in, in a few days, it'll pop back up and say, hey, you didn't reply to this one. Is this something you want? you wanted to consider. So these are all great examples, and they're saving billions of characters of typing in, in just a week, per week. So what might machine learning enable for your customer experience? And more importantly, how is your company going to react as customer expectations continue to rise? Because more than 50% of online consumers will leave your site and not consider revisiting if they've had a bad user experience. So I've laid out how important it is, but how, so how do you keep up? What do you actually do to think about this challenge? How should you frame it? And we've kind of heard three recurring themes over the course of time. Help me faster, know me better, and wow me everywhere. And I'll take us through each one of these. And let me start with what's arguably the lowest hanging fruit, which is speed. We are an impatient society. We don't want to wait too long for our package to arrive, for our rideshare to show up, or for our mobile sites to load. But the reality is we don't do a very good job here. On average, it takes 15 seconds for a mobile site page to fully load in the US. So what if I were to pause up here for 15 seconds? Okay, I'll spare you the discomfort. I can see people were already getting restless. So I've, I've done this before. Um, and you can see people just get really restless. They get kind of, anno the, the annoyance is, li is rising in the room and I start to lose your attention. So think about that. And here I am like dancing in front of you all to keep your attention. If your mobile site is just sitting there loading, slow to load, you can imagine that those people are going to start bouncing elsewhere. And the other thing I want to make sure you realize is that, that sometimes I see that that execs call this like a developer problem. And the reality is that everyone needs to be concerned about speed because it really shows that customers will leave your site if you're not delivering quickly. 53% of visitors will, will lose, will move on rather, after three seconds. Think of how impatient people are. So they're not gonna wait for your experience to load because they are task oriented. They are task loyal. They are focusing on what can they do to achieve their business at hand. And one question is, so well, how fast do you need to be? So let me give you some context around this. Recent retail study showed that a one second delay can cause a 20% impact on conversion rates. That's one second. You know that these add up, so you can do the math. So the bottom line here is that speed can materially impact your business. And the thing I always find ironic is that so many, particularly the marketers in the room, you spend so much time optimizing the campaign and things that happen before you get to the site, and then you lose double-digit conversions once they get there. So all your hard work is kind of lost. So what can you do about this? Well, the first step is always to determine, do I, in fact, have a problem? And we Google developed a tool, and I'll pause here. If like, people want to take a picture of this URL, it's not the most intuitive thing to remember, but um, I encourage you to either on a coffee break or when you get back to your office tomorrow to go to this website and test your M site URL. So it's super, super simple. You plug in your URL and it will come back with a comprehensive report giving you a speed score. It'll estimate the percentage of visitors who you are losing due to speed issues. And it will more importantly provide you with a custom report of areas to focus on. It literally takes one minute to do, um, but it really gives you a great action plan for what you can work on with your developers. So here's a couple examples. You can see your speed of individual pages or your site as a whole. You can see how you're doing this month compared to last month to see if you've made progress, which is always encouraging. Um, you can benchmark yourself a bunch of, a bunch of different ways. And, and more importantly, you can, it'll give you tips on things that you can do to actually improve, whether that's minimizing or, or let's say eliminating um, some heavy loading images. You can get a feel for what good looks like and then figure out what your plan should be. And there's also a calculator that allows you to understand the impact that speed is having on your conversion rate, et cetera. Um, and 
so there, there's a lot in here that will give you some action items to be able to just focus on some of the kind of more straightforward things that you can do to improve your, your site speed. Now, if you're feeling more aggressive or you really want to lean into this experience, you might want to consider a progressive, a progressive web app or PWA. Now, I like to think of PWAs as the labradoodle of mobile experiences. So it kind of, you know, like if a labradoodle, you get the playful personality of a lab with the hypoallergenic qualities of a poodle. Um, similarly, with the PWA, you get the best of an, an app and a mobile website in one experience. So from the, the app side of the family, you get speed of, of loading and you also get the ability to do notifications um, to re-engage with customers, but no, like an, a mobile website, no install is required. So pretty cool, right? So we have hundreds of global brands that are, that are now launching um, PWAs, and one of those is Spotify. Um, and we're going to hear from Spotify later today. This was a company that started off as an app-first, app-only company. So they had a mobile app, they had a desktop app, and they had what was only essentially a splash page for their M site. And they're a very data-driven company as well, and they started realizing when they looked at the data that tons, millions of people were coming to their M site to research bands and to look up, um, look up albums, et cetera, um, but they couldn't listen to music on the M site. So they realized that something, something was missing here, and so they developed a PWA. And they saw a nice uptick in a couple of metrics that really matter to them. So there's a 54% 54, 54 increase in day one plays. And even more interestingly, 30% of these MWeb, these PWA customers, actually went on to download the app. So you might surmise that these were people who weren't sure if they were willing to commit to the app, but they tried it out on MWeb. So there was no cannibalization. This was a huge growth driver for their business because they recognize this whole kind of untapped, underserved market. So they really put the customer at the heart of what they were trying to do here. So I've mentioned that a couple tools and given you some ideas, but here's, here's the big point I want to get across. Investing in speed is a company-wide issue and it deserves constant vigilance. So many times you see people come together, they work on improving their speed, they maybe get the page load from nine seconds to six seconds, they celebrate high five and they go off to their corners. And the next thing you know, over time, the marketing people add a few more images and the engineers and developers add a few more scripts. And then you look back at the, at the time and it's back up to nine seconds or beyond. So this really does take constant monitoring it's something that you should all be looking at on a regular basis to make sure that you're keeping the bar high on how quickly your pages are loading. So I want you to be maniacal about monitoring speed and shaving seconds off because as you do, your conversions will improve. So the second big theme to consider is around knowing me better. So this is all about personalized experiences. And oftentimes consumers, so here's the thing, consumers expect brands to have a personalized experience based on their shared history, but oftentimes brands tell us that they can't, they don't know if it's worth the investment, that they can't quantify if they actually go there, will it actually be worth their while. So if you've been waiting for proof, I have some data for you. A 2018 Epsilon study showed that personalized experiences can have a direct impact on a brand's bottom line. So let's look first at the consumer lens for this. 80% of consumers are more likely to do business with a company that offers a personalized experience. And, uh, and consumers who believe that personalized experiences are appealing are 10 times more likely to become a brand's most valuable customer. And marketers are seeing the results as well. 98% of marketers say that personalization advances customer relationships, and 90% report a measurable lift in business performance from these efforts. So who's doing this well? One of my favorite examples is Hilton. They realized that their guests were operating their lives from the palm of their hand using their mobile device. And so with that in mind, they set out to figure out how can they make the most personalized experience possible for their guests. So the Hilton Honors app, they've called it the remote control to their guest Hilton experience. So starting off with the fact that you can pick the very room in the app that you want to stay in in that property. 
you can then personalize the experience by talk, uh, you can select which you can have food ordered ahead or drinks. You can order special pillows to arrive when you get there or at a time that works for your schedule. And when you go to check in, you can bypass the line altogether as well as a checkout. And the other fun thing is that you use your mobile device as your card key. So no more dumping out your purse or searching through like I do to find how, where did that key go to get into your room. It's all part of your phone. And they have this functionality at more than 3,000 of their properties. And when they launched the app, they had 100% repeat usage. So clearly they have tapped into something that really works. And it's, and it's actually quite fun too, um, to be able to to see how they're looking to personalize. And I've, I've talked with their CMO previously about things like um, having specific music available for you in the room when you arrive. So they're really tuned in to you as an individual. So they're really putting the customer at the heart of all of their decisions around the experience. And I think travel companies in general are very focused on the experience and some, some folks you can learn from. And like speed, personalization isn't a nice to have feature. It's a business priority that's critical to experience. So spend some time with your data and your site analytics teams and figure out what is it that we could be doing to better personalize the experience for our customers. And then last me, lastly, it's talking about seamless experiences, right? How do we wow them everywhere on their desktop site, whether interacting with you in person at a store or in your app, and especially on their mobile device. So let's take a look at a company that's, that's doing this well and how did they get there. So Walgreens has quite literally organized their organization around a single view of the customer. So they recognize that while they're a brick and mortar pharmacy company, they realize that mobile was a great bridge to be able to relate to people as they're both in the digital and physical space. So what they did was they have teams that now collaborate on a regular basis to share insights, look at consumer research, and figure out how can we better improve the customer's experience through all the different Walgreens touch points. One of the examples of a feature that came out of this collaboration is the ability to connect directly with a pharmacist or a doctor via the app. And so the important thing, to, and what they also realized is that an in-store customer who interacts with their app in addition to their store is six times more valuable than someone who just comes in, um, only deals with them kind of in the physical world. So those that are engaged across all the touch points are, are six times more valuable to them. And in order for them to have gotten to this point, they had to take a customer-centric view, right? They couldn't but mobile could not exist in a silo. It was really part of everybody's job. And later today, you're going to hear from Russ Freeman, who is our head of mobile UX at Google, and he will speak about how the long-term success and sustainability of your business and partnerships is really, it can't occur if you have silos like this. So more to come on that front. And so I'll close with these reminders. First, put the consumer at the heart of everything that you do. Remember that you are competing not just with the other folks in your category, but with the best experience that that consumer has ever had. And this, no one is immune from this. This transcends industry and device type. You really have to think broadly because the bar has risen so high. Secondly, customer experience is not a product challenge or a marketing challenge. It's a business priority. So regardless of your function, you and, the t you and your teams are the ones who should be thinking about how you deliver these expectations for your customers. It's the responsibility of the entire company to help them faster, know them better, and wow them everywhere. And I hope, time the, next, I hope the next time that you see me or you encounter someone else talking about the importance of mobile experience, that you'll be giving them the hand signal because you feel that connection and that you're on board. Thank you.